Our main speaker tonight is on my right hand side, Jyoti Brar. And if at the end there is a few minutes left for me, I might say something. <laughs> if, if not, you must, must be prepared to, 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 to listen to Jyoti and that's it. And Jyoti, Jyoti Brar. Comrades, thank you, Comrade Chair, for that introduction. Of course, you know it's a lie. I am the, very much the secondary speaker tonight, um, but I do hope, nevertheless, that what I have to say will both interest and inspire you. That is the function of these meetings. We're not here just to toll the bell. Look, once upon a time, a long time ago, we managed a revolution. We are here to learn the lessons, to be inspired, to take courage, to have faith in ourselves as working class people, that we collectively can do the same. We have the power to do just what the people did in Russia in 1917. And hearing some of the details about what they did and how they did it helps us to realise, you know, this is our history. This is not some event from a history book that has nothing to do with us. This is intimately involved in our lives. This is our future that we're talking about. Um, I just want to talk a little bit tonight about why it is that celebrating October and learning the truth about the Soviet Union is so very important. You know, those of us here who were born in Britain or in other Western imperialist countries, we've grown up in a bubble of lies and misinformation that is so all-encompassing that it really takes a great effort to prick even a tiny hole in that and start to perceive reality as it really is. Um, inside this media bubble, the propaganda of socialism as a prison camp, of Stalin as an evil baby-eating murderer, is absolutely unceasing. A typical example was in a TV programme, it's actually a couple of years ago now, um, it's an episode of a cop show called New Tricks, and they had an episode where uh, an East German man had joined the Stasi, he'd infiltrated the Stasi, so he didn't agree with, of course, what human being would, he didn't agree with East German socialism, the regime, he had infiltrated the Stasi in order to fight for freedom. And he and his wife were shown practically throwing their new baby through a hole they'd cut in the wire to some West Germans on the other side who they'd never met, didn't know these people from Adam, right? And there's a clear message in that, isn't there? This is such normal propaganda, nobody questions it. There was nothing in the paper the next day about, that was a bit insane, wasn't it? Right? This is normal. This, is, this kind of thing is repeated so often that we just, it becomes the truth. Okay? But obviously the message is, those people would rather throw their baby to strangers than allow it to grow up under socialism. God, socialism must be dreadful. Right? That's the message. Don't ever think what your future might be in socialism. Don't imagine that there's an option there for you. Um, and these kind of truths are repeated so often that we don't think most of us to question it. You know, that's how the information bubble is being constantly reinforced. That's how our rulers hope to prevent us from bothering to try to find out information for ourselves. And that being the case, this bubble being so well constructed and frequently reinforced, then people ask us, why do we insist on celebrating and talking about this revolution that happened 97 years ago? Why do we insist on keeping alive the memory of a place that most British workers have been taught to despise and fear since birth? It doesn't seem like a good strategy for getting popular. Lots of people tell us if we drop the name communist and if we drop all our references to Bolshevism to the USSR, we'd grow much more quickly. And after all, isn't that what you want to do? But as Shakespeare said, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It isn't our name or even our references to Stalin that make us unpalatable to the mainstream to the imperialist narrative, it's our class allegiance, it's our political content, and that puts us completely beyond the pale as far as British corporate approved mainstream is concerned. 
To be acceptable in the imperialist media's alternative reality, you have to fit in with this carefully constructed mirage of left and right parties. You know, our media are full of these fake choices and false debates, and we're constantly being diverted. Look at this debate between Labour and Conservatives over here. Look at this falling out between UKIP and the, and the Tories over here. Fake debates, false choices. The reality is that these are put in front of workers in the hopes that they won't notice that all the options being presented are essentially the same. These people all have the same narrative about what our society is and where it came from and where it's going. And they have the same one-point programme, and their one-point programme is Save British Imperialism. That is it. <laughs> and the difference between them and us, we the communists, is that we don't play that game. We refuse to go along with the capitalist ruling class's version of history or to participate in propping up the folk debates. We insist on finding out the truth and doing everything in our power to show that truth to working people. We want to celebrate and learn from October for the same reason that our rulers are so desperate to keep us away from it. We want to spread, and they want to prevent the spread of, an understanding of what October 1917 represented to <coughs> humanity and what the Soviet people achieved under working class rule. Because the truth is, if we don't understand the October Revolution, actually, we don't understand anything about the modern world. Our world has been totally shaped by October and the repercussions of that revolution. It brought in a new historical epoch, and it shattered forever 101 pillars of capitalist propaganda. They've done their best to shore it up again, but they've been on shaky ground ever since. Even here in Britain, which feels so far away from the turmoil of proletarian revolution, the way we think, the way we live, has been irreversibly shaped by the gains that workers made in the Soviet Union. They never tell you that in your history books at school, do they? The fact is that most of the advantages that we receive as workers in Britain, and which we're told came to us because we're lucky <coughs> enough to live in a successful capitalist country, by which they mean an imperialist one, um, and a civilised capitalist democracy, aren't you lucky, are actually weak reflections and pale imitations of the advances that the soci socialist system delivered to the workers of the Soviet Union. And after they delivered those, workers all over the world started to demand them too. So what are the things that are held up to us as proof that our life in Britain is civilised and good and capitalism works really well? We're told we have democratic and enlightened values. We're free to think what we like and express our views. We're free to take part in politics. We can stand for election. We can vote. The welfare state looks after the most vulnerable in society. How civilised, well done capitalism. Education and health care are provided for all. Our society upholds the concepts of personal liberty and equality. Our court system upholds the law. Our journalists uphold free speech. Try not to laugh. <laughs> we can expect to go about our business free from discrimination or racism. We're at peace with our neighbours. Our rulers uphold the rights of nations to self-determination. That's, that's what they tell us. These are the civilised values that our democratic capitalist society upholds. That is the myth. Don't knock the table, Jackie. That's what we're told. But what is the truth? The truth is that none of these things was true for workers before the October Revolution, and much of it is still not true, or only partially true, even today, nearly a hundred years later, despite the huge wealth that flows into this country from the super-exploitation super and oppression of the vast masses all over the world. You know, pressure on the British ruling class to grant concessions to working people came as a result of the example that was set by October by the Soviet Union. All over the world, anger was building against the imperialist system, which was condemning workers to a seemingly endless cycle of catastrophic war and horrendous deepening poverty as it lurched from crisis to crisis. Workers looked eagerly at the advances being made by their brothers and sisters in the USSR, and the revolutionary anti-imperialist movement in all countries grew enormously, as did the prestige of communism and the Communist Party leaders. 
much to the alarm of the capitalist world. So I'm not going to go through each one of those rights in turn, although I would really love to. I guess you probably don't. I haven't really earned the right to do a Fidel on you and make you sit there for four hours, but you never know. One of these days. Um, but let's take a look at just, say, two of the items on that list of values that we're taught to believe are the hallmarks of an advanced capitalist society. So this is me cutting some things out here. If you think I'm going on, be grateful. <laughs> Equality of nations and peoples. The October Revolution declared all imperialist war and occupation, annexation, annexation and colonial seizure to be criminal. It declared all peoples of the world, no matter what their race, religion or colour, to be equal and outlawed all discrimination. <coughs> and by involving people from Asia, who had previously been designated as too backward to rule themselves, and people believed it, you know, it was repeated so much, not only white people, they, the colonised people themselves believed it must be true. They'd been conquered by these people, they were told constantly that they were useless, they weren't fit to rule themselves, and many of them looked around the world and saw this seems to be the way it is and, and kind of accepted their lot. But the Soviet people proved that there is absolutely no justification for any kind of racism. USSR replaced xenophobia, bigotry, and fratricidal warfare with cooperation, respect, fraternal harmony, and it showed the immense contribution that all people are able to make to the building of a higher culture and a truly civilised life when they're given the chance. And this example turned the prevailing supremacy myths on their heads. It inspired millions of oppressed people all over the world to join the fight against imperialism. It brought to an end the era when open racism and naked colonialism could be tolerated. That's why something like Israel was doomed to failure right from the beginning. The age where you can go and trample other people's rights and expect them to let you get away with it because you've got bigger weapons was over with the October Revolution. October launched an unstoppable tide of national liberation movements. After the October Revolution, no people would any longer resign themselves to the inevitability of foreign domination. The first wave of great leaders of the oppressed were directly inspired and brought to Marxism by the October Revolution. Mao Zedong in China, Kim Il-sung in Korea, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, Bhagat Singh in India. These giants of the national liberation movement followed the road of October. They came to politics by watching what happened in the Soviet Union and saying, we want some of that. <laughs> and then a second wave of great leaders of the oppressed world were directly inspired and brought to Marxism by the construction of socialism and the second wave of socialist revolutions. So after the Chinese revolution, after the... Uh, the Korean Revolution, then we saw Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro in Cuba, George Habash in Palestine, and many, many more great leaders and movements around the world, again inspired by the feats and achievements of the Soviet people, directly a response and a result of what the Soviet people did after October. in turn inspired movements against racism at home in the imperialist heartlands. Today, no sane person would admit the idea that race is a justifiable basis for discrimination. The first anti-racism legislation was very weak. It was passed in Britain in 1965. It may be a pathetic sock. It may be observed more in the breach than the observance, as they say. But its existence was an omission of moral defeat by imperialism. They could no longer barefacedly say what they used to say loudly and clearly and plainly. Now they have to hide the truth of their racism behind words about equality. They lost the argument. And whether it's princes with swastikas, 
mayors denigrating Pekinese or the deaths of half a million Iraqi children ruthlessly dismissed as collateral damage. The system's politicians and spokespeople are continually being caught out in their double standards, which further underlines the absolute loss of the moral high ground by capitalism in general. Skipping a bit more. Um, yeah, so one more of these rights that we're taught to think of as something that comes with living in a civilised capitalist democracy. The right to the universal provision of basic necessities. Now, of course, today, it's much easier to make this argument than it was 15 years ago because we're living through the time of accelerating destruction of what we once were thought to think of as taught to think of as permanent gains that had been delivered to us by a combination of you know, our brave socialist leaders in the Labour Party and their class struggle and you know, the, the kind of general advance to civilisation of capitalism in Britain. In fact, the October Revolution brought with it the first ever system of universal provision for all members of society. Free and complete health care free education at all levels, the right to employment in the towns or to land and tools in the countryside, the right to a home, the right to food, the right to a decent pension for all those too old or too infirm to work, the right to sick leave and maternity <coughs> leave on full pay, the right to leisure, to holidays, to culture, the right to become fully rounded human beings. The capitalists had always insisted, up until that point, that these basic demands of working people were just too expensive. Enterprises would be rendered uncompetitive, workers would end up losing their jobs altogether <coughs> if employers tried to provide more than basic wages to their employees. That was always the argument. When socialists said, can't we have a bit more, can't we have at least a pension, can't we have something that means we don't starve and we don't have jobs, they said, well, you know, of course we'd love to, but we'll be uncompetitive, we'll go out of work, it can't be done. But the universal provision of all the necessities of life in the USSR and the constantly rising conditions of life that was achieved by the Soviet workers in the 1930s, and that at a time when the workers in the rest of the world were being ground down by the worst ever, at that point, capitalist crisis, um, inspired the workers of the world with a vision of what socialism could achieve for them. And so, as the crisis deepened, the revolutionary tide around the world grew. And the imperialist ruling classes initially responded with fascist dictatorship. But the tide could not be turned. The experience of the Great Depression, of imperialism's fascist brutality and crisis, and of the horrendous war that the crisis spawned, brought workers all over the world to revolution. The incredible achievements and the heroic sacrifices of the Soviet people in defeating Nazi Germany added to the already high prestige of communism. The name of Joseph Stalin, the Soviet people's great teacher and leader, was revered by workers and peasants throughout the world. his death, and he predicted it, great man that he was, since his death, there has been an unceasing campaign to vilify the name of Joseph Stalin. But the tide even there is turning. In Russia now, whose vote is the greatest Russian ever these days? It's always, it's always the man who wasn't even Russian. <laughs> you know? That working class Georgian man who came from nowhere to lead the Soviet people in the construction of socialism is now looked back on his time, despite all of the lies that have been told about him for so many decades, now that people have had 20 years of the restoration of capitalism to find out what capitalism really is, who do they look back to? They don't look back to Brezhnev. They don't look back to Gorbachev. They look back to the days of real socialist construction when... Here's a flatline economy. Here's what most of the world was doing. That's what the Soviet Union was doing. Every year they had statistics that no capitalist country has ever achieved. Every year, year upon year upon year upon year, the growth of their economy was something staggering and incredible to see. And no 
capitalist uh, apologist or economist can ever come up with a satisfactory excuse <laughs> for why that was. They talk total rubbish when they try and do it, and mostly they just wish you'd shut up. And, well, it was a temporary blip. It couldn't, it couldn't last, could it? <laughs> yeah, and the people were all really miserable. But why is it that today, despite all the lies which are told, the person who the people of the former Soviet Union look back to with the most nostalgia is Stalin? To the point that nationalists who are actually serving you know, uh, capitalist interests in, in trying to divide people and uh, incite racism in their usual, in the demagogic way that, that, that nationalists do, who do they pick on as their national leader? Joseph Stalin. I mean, the poor guy, so, so unfair for him to be used that way. But isn't it interesting, this phenomenon of national Bolshevism? You know, fascists are always demagogic. They always have to pick on something that will appeal to people in order to peddle their crap. Isn't it interesting, the thing they chose to pick in Russia, these right-wingers, is Stalin. That tells you something, not about... Stalin's politics, but about what he means in the hearts of people, you know, of Russia. And all over the world, you know, socialism is again becoming something that people want to know about, despite all the lies they've been told, despite the 60 years of revisionism that's really ravaged our movement and left us at sixes and sevens. <coughs> socialism was once more back on the agenda. And I have no doubt in my mind that we'll have the last laugh, and no doubt in my mind that future histories of humanity will put Joseph Stalin back where he belongs. <laughs> Sorry, back to the, back to the text. Uh, revolutions swept across the formerly occupied territories of Europe <coughs> and throughout the colonies, from China and Korea in the east to the European people's democracies in the west, socialism spread in a new wave. In Western Europe, the revolutionary wave was only stopped by a combination of American cash and British and American weapons. Revolutions in Greece, in Italy, in France were decapitated, diverted and put down and, under pressure of these great events and in fear for the very existence of their system of exploitation, the imperialists united to save themselves. That is why, in the centres of imperialism, the capitalists suddenly found that it was not only possible but entirely practical, necessary and affordable to provide certain basic minimums to workers at home. And the age of welfare capitalism was born. We owe our NHS, our council houses, our school and university system, our pensions, our unemployment benefits entirely to the October Revolution. example it set, to the inspiration and courage it gave to the workers of the world, and to the terrible fear it put in the hearts of the capitalists, who saw the foundations of their rule crumbling away before their eyes. All these concessions of the capitalist welfare state were meant to pacify us and stop us from thinking that socialism had any more to offer us. But they're stunted versions of the originals. They're a nod to popular feeling and they stretch only as far as absolutely necessary to buy social peace. Often they're observed more in the breach than in the letter of the law and daily undermined by the conditions of capitalist existence. And, as we're seeing very clearly today, the welfare provisions in imperialist countries were a temporary stabilisation measure. You can't rely on anything you gain under capitalism if you allow the capitalists to remain in place. And any trade union activist can tell you the same thing. If you're not policing every gain you've made every day with every fibre of your being and mobilising people to defend them, they will be taken away. Once the post-war reconstruction boom was over, capitalism lurched back into economic crisis and the gradual chipping away at all the welfare states in Western imperialist countries began. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that gradual chipping was replaced by a wrecking ball. And the latest twist of the crisis is now bringing wholesale destruction to the very foundations of health, housing, education and benefit systems that British workers once believed they'd won for good. Most importantly of all, the October Revolution gave the lie to the capitalist myth that private property relations are eternal, are sacred and inevitable, 
and it created public socialist property and a new kind of socialist state that was capable of administering that property with the full participation of ordinary working people and in their interests. As Stalin put it, the indubitable successes of socialism in the USSR on the front of construction have clearly shown that the proletariat can successfully govern the country without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, that it can successfully build industry without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, that it can successfully direct the whole of the national economy without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, that it can successfully build socialism in spite of the capitalist encirclement. So it's not possible to, to go into detail today, however much I would love to, about all the great advances that were achieved by workers in the USSR. I would like to share a few salient facts about one of them. It's the Soviet health system. You know, people here love the NHS. But let's understand how much better a socialist healthcare system is than even the best days of the NHS were. On a completely different plane. You know, the Soviets pioneered the approach that healthcare is not just about treatment of disease and symptoms, but is primarily about disease prevention. So their health policy extended to every sphere of life, totally joined up. So they tied this into the whole idea of the well-being of every person of society. The Soviet government focused, therefore, on providing decent housing, education, employment, cultured leisure time. It strove to help every worker feel happy and useful to reduce stress and provide everything that's needed for a fulfilling life. Best way not to get sick. According to Professor N. Kropograschenkov, who was Assistant People's Commissar of Public Health, he said, in the USSR, unemployment, destitution and poverty have been permanently done away with on the basis of the abolition of the exploitation of man by man. In a remarkably short period of time, the socialist state has succeeded in raising the material and cultural level of the entire population enormously, thereby laying a firm foundation for successful work in the field of public health. The USSR wiped out slums, built sewerage systems in town and country alike, electrified the country. The quantity and quality of food available to ordinary people was constantly increased. The Soviet state included in its health work such key factors as environmental protection of soil, water and air from pollution and the organisation of public catering on a scientific and hygienic basis. Before the revolution, the USSR, the whole territory, had fewer than 20,000 doctors. 20 years later, it had 132,000. Now imagine all the trees. You can't just say you be a doctor. With the, with the best will in the world, you have to train them. Meanwhile, hospital beds increased from 175,000 to 350,000, and nursery places. And remember that World Health Organization report a few years back, which I often like to cite, which said that the best way to reduce health inequality is to provide nursery education equally to every member of society. Number one recommendation of the World Health Organization, how to reduce health inequality, nursery education. So listen to this. Nursery places in the Soviet Union in the space of 20 years went from 11,000 to 5.75 million. That's people who are serious about looking after the next generation. And there was a requirement on every single doctor to spend one day a month giving public lectures in preventive medicine, in public parks, in lecture rooms, in health centres, in schools, and these were backed up by poster campaigns and pamphlets. Thousands on thousands of committees of workers in factories, farms and workplaces cooperated with their local health workers to give feedback, to improve services, to oversee spending, to ensure hygienic conditions in their workplaces and nurseries and to organise health education at work. People were involved in their health service. They didn't see it as something separate from them. It belonged to them and they were part of it. They sent delegates to the Soviets that supervised and inspected hospitals and sanitary establishments, and from there to the district supervising bodies and the Commissariat of Health. The Health Commissariat worked with industry to prevent the output of harmful substances into the air. 
industrial workers were closely monitored. Those working with dangerous substances worked shorter hours, had extra monitoring, and were given extra foods. Much lower thresholds of dangerous gases were allowed into the Soviet Union's air. For example, a 40 times lower limit of hydrogen cyanide was accepted in the air of the USSR as opposed to the air of the USA in 1938. Taking into account the chronic effect of small doses of noxious substances, something which our rulers always try to brush aside. Say, oh, a little bit doesn't matter, a little bit doesn't matter, a little bit doesn't matter. The Soviets were serious about people's health because they looked at it and found out, oh, well, actually, you add up all these little bits and they do start to matter. So let's take this seriously. Noise pollution controls were introduced in cities, everything from muffling industrial procedures to banning the use of car horns in cities. The descriptions of eyewitnesses to the feats achieved by Soviet workers and farmers in all areas of life under socialist planning make truly inspirational reading. And I really urge you to go and read some of those accounts from the 30s, 40s and 50s because they bring to life like nothing else can just what socialism really means and what it could, you know, you just transplant it to your life, to Britain and imagine that future, imagine living that kind of a life. You know, nothing will separate you from the revolution after that. This is the example our rulers want to keep from us. They want us to be resigned to our fate and to accept the false world of their propaganda bubble without question. They want us to bear the burden of their economic crisis on our backs. They want to take food from the mouths of our children and the books out of their hands. They want to turn off the radiators in our retirement bungalows and send us to the queue for voluntary euthanasia when they can no longer find a use for us and our savings have run out. They want us to feel that it is we the multiplying poor, who are a burden to them, the job creators. They want to hide from us the truth that all their wealth was created by workers at home and abroad, and that without them clinging on to the fruits of all that labour, we could all enjoy access to a decent, civilised, constantly rising and truly human level of existence. <laughs> Stalin summed up the significance of the October Revolution in 1928 when he said that the era of the stability of capitalism has passed away, carrying away with it the legend of the indestructibility of the bourgeois order. The era of the collapse of capitalism has begun. Comrades, there is no escape from poverty, from environmental degradation and waste, from devastation and war, racism, ignorance and disease except through a socialist revolution. October showed us that revolution and socialism are not merely nice ideas, but that we can make a revolution in practice and we can follow it by building a socialist society and a world fit for future generations. In 1921, Lenin told the workers of the USSR, we have made the start. When, at what date and time, and the proletarians of which nation will complete this process is not important. The important thing is that the ice has been broken, the road is open, and the way has been shown. Now, comrades, we owe a great debt of gratitude to those icebreakers and road clearers of the Soviet Union who showed humanity the way out of the imperialist spiral of poverty and war. <coughs> Let us carry forward the work of Lenin, Stalin, the Bolsheviks and the Soviet people in fighting to create a new socialist world that is fit for human beings. Let us hold by, hold high the red banner and take the road of October until its final victory. Long live October. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Cuba. Cuba. We're glad you have to come, baby. So. They got the hookers on their trips to the club. And every time I turn the trips to the job, and then you get to the club. It's been a blow cause they got the TV, we got the truth They own the judges and we got the proof We got hella people, they got helicopters They got the bombs and we got the, 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 we